So Tony, uh, the Open is almost upon us and uh, you are synonymous for a number of things, uh, particularly in golf, one of which is, is the Open. You, of course, won the Open in 69. Before we talk about that experience, how does uh, a boy from Scunthorpe, son of a truck driver, get himself in a position to be someone who can even compete at something like the Open? It must have been a journey just to get to there. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, timing is everything. Uh, it was 1953, my father got in, introduced to the game and uh, you know, I was 13, I was, uh, well, I was about nine, sorry, then. Um, and uh, I went along, I used to pull his trolley. There was nothing to do where I lived, uh, it, close to where I lived in town. I, you know, uh, there was no money, no, no toys and stuff. It was just, it was a boring sort of uh, early existence. And I used to go with my dad, that was interesting, pull his trolley and uh, saw his frustration but when uh, with with golf at that time and when we were out of the members way i would have a go and it wasn't long before i got cut down hickory clubs and and was able to participate and i knew that ball wasn't going to move until i moved it and so the summers were spent uh slept at home and i spent the rest of the time on the golf course intrigued by the fact that this thing wouldn't move Ben Hogan had won the uh, Open Championship and, and two other majors. He didn't play in the PGA that year, but he was the predominant uh, player. Sports, or Golf Illustrated was the only magazine we had. Uh, we certainly didn't have television or any golf on television. But I, I saw how important uh, Hogan thought the fundamentals were. I followed those to a T and I had all the hours God sent to, to get good and, I, and by, before I knew where I was I was 13 and I was pretty competent then I had a 12 handicap and a couple of things happened that year Bobby Locke came to the club to visit and play an exhibition with our professional who was probably at best about an 8 handicap God bless him and, and uh, I was dispatched to the other end of the clinic when Locke was given a clinic and he hit his first ball and it plugged and I prized it out of the ground, put it in the bag, wiped it off, put it in the bag and the next shot he hit went straight into the same pitch mark. And you know, it was an impressionable age, 13. Uh, and uh, I thought, my God, you know, there's still a ways to go. Uh, but that stuck and later that year, the Ryder Cup came to Lindrick, which was 60 miles away from Scunthorpe, my dad, was keen by then, did I want to go and see? And that was the first opportunity I had to see world-class players. Uh, coupled with the fact it was a watershed year for Great Britain and Ireland because Dyrese's team won. But for me, it was an uh, opportunity to get up close to the best players uh, in the world. And I went back to the club that night and played and inspired the best nine holes I'd ever played. And it went on from there. I became a county player. All I wanted to do was be a professional. There was no money uh, to, to do that. It meant leaving home and going to London because no clubs in, England, in Lincolnshire uh, could afford assistant professionals. And my dad wasn't up for that because there was too much risk. I went into the steelworks like most of the young lads in Scunthorpe did and spent a year there, which I hated, and secretly wrote off for jobs. And I got an interview at uh, Potter's Bar in North London and I pleaded with my father to take me. And I said, if you, you don't like what you hear, then we'll come, come back. But of course, Bill Shankland, who was a, a great salesman, uh, convinced my father that uh, six pounds a week working for him was better than three pounds, 11 and threepence at uh, the steelworks. And uh, January 62, I was on my road as a professional. And quickly I, I learned that I didn't want to be in the shop doing all the mundane things club professionals have to do. And so I continued to work hard at my game and um, played well in the Middlesex Championship uh, that year and, and uh, played in my first Open in 1963. I made the cut and uh, really never looked back. I, Bill Shankland and I 
were, were a bit like this uh, all the time. And uh, I started to play in 1963 the British and Irish circuit. I continued to improve because I was playing with better players all the time, learning from them. And uh, by the time 1967 came round, I was, uh, uh, got my first master's invitation. I was in the Far East playing and uh, got drawn with no other than Arnold Palmer in the first two rounds, who I was petrified, of course, hardly slept, but somehow managed to, uh, you know, stay with him, beat his score, get people's attention. And I would have to say that that was the beginning of the, of the real run. Uh, later that year, I won the Dunlop Masters, had the first hole-in-one on British TV. Uh, but people think that's marvellous, but of course in those days they only televised the last three holes, and if there wasn't a par three there, you couldn't do it. Uh, but uh, I got my tour card in America, and in the spring of 68, I won the first, for the first time. It was a, I was on the ascendancy, and I was hungry, and I was ambitious, and uh, uh, I was young and resilient, and uh, nothing was going to get in the way. And uh, that, that win at Jacksonville, ironically, was playing alongside Palmer and Don January in the final round. And of course the gallery was all a bit biased towards them. I was a sort of imposter at the time. Uh, and, uh, but that stood me in good stead mentally. I was becoming tougher and tougher and tougher. And by the time 69 came round, I got to Royal Lytham, where I'd already done nicely six years before. Uh, the British galleries were there, and they were behind me, and that was an uplifting feeling. Uh, I managed to get off to a reasonable start, and I was in the, in the mix early, and gradually um, got to where I was leading the thing. And Bob Charles and I played the last two round, or the last round together. I kept my nose ahead, and I had that sort of mental toughness to, uh, that I'd learned you know, in that recent that two or three years coming up to it, I had the resilience and mental toughness to fortunately get it done, and it was, of course, a life changer. When you went into that Open, you, you had huge self-belief, didn't you? When, when you consider it was and will always be seen as one of the great eras of, of golf, you mentioned Palmer, there was Player, there was Nicholas, there was, there was Harrison, I mean, there, there, there were so many guys household names in sport, let alone golf. Where did that belief come from? Because British golf wasn't uh, littered with global names, uh, not then and indeed for many years before, but by the 69 Open, you believed you could take these guys on, didn't you? Yeah, well, as I said, I was, I was ambitious and, you know, it makes me smile uh, today or the modern day, you know, that so many of these young players uh, uh, relate to their coaches and uh, but you know I didn't think there was any better way to learn than playing alongside the best players in the world and I knew that if I wanted to be and I'd put it in my mind and I think this is the greatest computer the world's ever known I mean not my mind but the human mind and and uh, I'd, I'd put it in there that I wanted to be the best player on the planet and I knew in, in order to do that I had to beat these guys that I was playing against Nicholas player Palmer, Trevino, whoever it was. And so I was picking their brains and I had a good imagination. I was watching everything they did very, very closely and just making headway all the time. So, but the, the most important thing of all was that I'd put it in my head. And once I got the opportunity to do it, I wasn't shocked. And I think if you haven't put it in there in the first place, uh, that you get the opportunity sometimes and now what? Uh, but it wasn't, it was, I'm not saying it was easy, it's never easy, but at least if you put it in there, you can deal with it. This is where I'm supposed to be, this is what I visualised, this is what I dreamed of, this is what I wanted. Come on, one foot in front of the other, you can do this. And, and so it goes. Golf is littered with famous shots. Uh, you, if you did your sort of 12 greatest shots in golf, you'd name 12 which everybody would recognise and, and remember. And arguably, your greatest shot in golf, at least the one that most people remember, 
was the drive on the 18th. Perhaps you'd like to set the scene and explain why it is remembered to this day as, as one of the great, great shots in golf. Well, uh, back in those days with the equipment we had, you know, persimmon drivers and, and a ballata ball, uh, the, the 18th hole at Lytham, there was no way to play safe. Uh, we all carried one irons in our backs as our safety club for driving, keeping the ball in play and it would make it run. The, the Lynx golf still played on the ground. But with a one iron, I couldn't clear the cross bunkers on, on, uh, at Lytham, so I, it was impossible to play safe. To lay up short of those would have been crazy. It would have left far too long a second shot. So it was one of those situations. It was driver or nothing. And the, the bunkers at each side of the fairway are so deep that if you go in them, you can't get on the green. And I was more than aware of the fact that Eric Brown, who was Ryder Cup captain and Scott at, and Dave Thomas and Christy O'Connor Sr. had all had opportunities at Lytham and made bad scores on the final hole, which cost them dear. So it was a really important tee shot. And uh, I can remember like it was yesterday because I was so mentally engaged, uh, teeing the ball up and just saying, you know, this is what you've worked for, you know, wide and smooth. And as I'm saying it, I'm doing it. And, and really, that's what being in the moment is, is all about. And, uh, you know, I was wide, I was smooth. I looked up and this thing's flying down the middle of the fairway. And uh, obviously, to say that there was relief there, it, it would be an understatement. But um, I think Longhurst, I saw later, it, it, he'd said, you know, something to the effect of what a corker. Uh, the longest all day or whatever it was and uh, but it still wasn't over but that that broke its back you know that was 60 percent of that hole getting that tee shot where i've got it and i, I had a nice easy seven iron to the green and uh, 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 walking down there lost my shoe the gallery all came in of course they let the gallery in on the final group and i got lost in there and somebody stood on my heel and then i remember putting my shoe back on but you know, being too embarrassed to sort of stay and and tie the lace, I waited for the, so the shoe was sort of hanging half hanging off, and I was waving at everybody. But it was a it was a, a incredible experience and an incredible time. And I think I'm right in saying it was the first time on British TV that the audience could watch a golf tournament in colour. Exactly. Yeah. So all the stars were aligned yeah. for you in a sense because you got your first hole in one on TV yeah. and, and now a British champion of, of the Open in yeah. donkey's years in colour, wonderful colour. Yeah. So that presumably only added to, to how your life changed as a result of winning the Open. Yeah, it was a special time and uh, you know, 25 years old it, and it all that happened Really, you know, in, in within uh, two years, you know, getting that master's invitation because uh, I was in, in in the Far East. Neil Coles was the t they invited the top four on our order of merit. Neil Coles wouldn't fly; he was the four. So they went down to fifth, which was me, and I got this telegram saying that I was in, uh, in the masters, and uh, really everything started to escalate from there and of course at that point in time I didn't know I was going to win the US Open 11 months later so I was uh, kind of on top of the world I suppose. No, no you were. Now we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about so sort of the, the second coming of Tony Jacklin which was which was the Ryder Cup but that period of time is as you say 11 months after winning the Open you, you go and win the US Open as well and for 11 months you were I think arguably if not definitely the best player in the world. Yeah, well, I had those two major trophies on my mantelpiece for a month or so. Uh, ironically, I only had one. I, I don't know whether he even had a picture of both of them together taken because in those days it didn't seem important, uh, you know, to to uh, record things uh, to, to the point it does today. But uh, uh, suffice to say, it was uh, it was a heady time. It was. Uh, hectic time trying to be all things to all people wondering what I should do uh, obligation wise and so on and so forth and being the first to have done it especially from the UK was uh, it was it wasn't all 
you know, uh, plain sailing, but uh, it was a fantastic time for me um, professionally and as an individual, you know, I, I'd, I'd, you know, my dreams were, had all come true and I was still only 25 years old. One of the great, one of the great stories uh, about you and the US Open, I mean, just think it happened today, was what you did with your check. <laughs> Perhaps you'd like to share that one with us. Well, it went to the cleaners, is what had happened. You know, I left it in my back pocket, and uh, I was wearing a pair of... I used to wear light-coloured, I used to like bright colours. Anyway, it inadvertently got left in my pocket and got... This is for how much? Washed. $30,000, yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it was. Now, and even more so then. Yeah, fortunately they knew who I was and they wrote me another check. I think that was, I don't quite know how it all ended up, but I, I got the I got the dough in the end anyway. And also, this was a, I think it's probably fair to say that the whole birth of the European tour, John Jacobs, the European tour, began and rode on the quest the, the crest of a wave that you had created. Yeah, I, I think there was a resurgence of interest in in golf at that time because of my major wins and. Uh, from a uh, personal standpoint, of course, I, I should have uh, been in America and stayed in America on the American tour. I did for a year or so, but I was still living and my home was in the UK and I was doing a lot of back and forth. And six or eight times across the Atlantic every year doing, and, and as I say, trying to be all things to all people. Uh, and uh, my manager at the time, Mark McCormack, was just sort of going global with his brand, IMG, Gene Shrimpton and Jean-Claude Keeley and Jackie Stewart, the, those uh, names he was managing. And he wanted me in Europe. I, I didn't realize at this point that I was a bit of a, a pawn in a, in a bigger game. But uh, by the time it got to 1972, I was pretty jaded with all of this back and forth and uh, decided to uh, help John Jacobs with his, you know, ideas for a European tour, and um, I came, and you know, played in the, you know, Scandinavian Open, the German Open, the Italian Open, which I won in uh, in '73, and 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 I won a, a couple of those uh, uh, big European events. But it was it was hard early because there was not much uh, uh, in Europe. There there wasn't the standard. Uh, that there had been in America in terms of course maintenance and so on and there was certainly not that much uh, uh, organization on, on within the European tour with regards to security and cameras and click 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 all the time going on you know and, and distractions uh, I found that disconcerting early on but uh, uh, I, I managed, uh, you know, I think we helped it along. I won tournaments most years. I, I, I got a bit of a kick in the teeth in 1972 in the championship when I was leading come, coming down the 71st hole and Torino chipped in and sadly I sort of uh, got a bit impatient and uh, didn't quite that, get that done that week. But that took a lot of confidence away from me. It, was, uh, it, it happened... Uh, as, as things do in life. I mean, he chipped in five times the last two rounds and I was playing with him. And, I, and to do it at that most critical time, so close to the end, uh, as I say, my patience, and his luck didn't run out, but my patience did. And, uh, and uh, I was never the same quite after that. It took a bit of that uh, self-confidence and resolve away. That's really interesting because all sports require a, a rock solid mentality, don't they? But but none more so than, than golf. So yeah. three years earlier, there you are as a young man on the 18th, very, very difficult shot, but, but it was never in doubt because you were so solid mentally. And then 72, where you've, you've got the open, you've got one hand on the jug, perhaps. Trevino chips in and you're still in a good position even when he chips in. But then it all, like a pack of cards, uh, disintegrates. Yeah. But as I say, and I can recollect it like it was yesterday, uh, my reaction to his fifth, that fifth chip in at that, on the seventh, because he was over the green in four, and I was just short of it in two. 
and it, he chips in for five. And my reaction was, you son of a gun, you're not going to beat me like that. And I took a rush at this putt, which was about 15 footer, and I hit it that awkward distance by, you know, two and a half feet, whatever it was. And I missed it coming back. Uh, you know, the reality of that all came, you know, over that two and a half footer. I put myself now under unnecessary pressure and I missed it. And, and, uh, and of course, he was in no time flat. He was on the 18th tee and he'd hit off and he was down the middle of the fairway. I didn't even finish second in the end. Jack, Jack nicked in between uh, him and I. But it, it did uh, big damage to my, uh, my mental process. And, and uh, I'd, I never thought prior to that that luck uh, was, was involved uh, to the degree that it certainly he experienced uh, you know, in front of me that, that and, and it sort of broke some sort of, something snapped in there uh, from a major championship standpoint. I never really featured again, but I won tournaments and I won tournaments by big numbers too. I mean, Scandinavian Open, I won by 12 or 13 shots and Bogota by 13 shots. And, but it was the majors that I wanted uh, more than anything. I'd set my heart on that early and, uh, and they're the ones that you're recognized for. There are, you know, there are epitome for professional golfers. If, you know, to, to a career without a major is, um, is an empty career as far as I'm concerned, you know, or was concerned. Sorry. Brilliant. Okay, we're good? So when you say that the words Tony Jackling, people think of a, a lot of things, but probably most of all, they think of either the Open, and the US Open, the, those majors that you won, and secondly, the Ryder Cup. Now, before we go into the glory years where you, you, you led uh, Europe, as it became, as a non-playing captain to victory and, and set the foundations, people forget that you also played in so many Ryder Cups, seven, in fact, in, in, in total. And uh, 67 was, was your first, and then 69, I think people also remember you for, for, for 69, partly because you were absolutely at the top of your game, but also because uh, uh, during a run, both before and after, where America just basically, the Ryder Cup, oh yes, that's where America wins. Well, they didn't that year. And of course, it's also famous for what remains, not just one of the, the most talked about, most famous, some people say controversial, most say one of the most sporting occasions that, that happen not just in golf but in sport at all so perhaps if you could uh, and uh, as you've already said your Ryder Cup experience began way before that when you were a kid and it was your first opportunity to see global stars so really the Ryder Cup is ingrained in you one way or another from a very early age right up to today oh absolutely I mean I've, I've always in, enjoyed uh, that encounter with uh uh, American friends. Uh, I, I think it's important to to, to 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 talk a bit more about you know the confidence the Americans came into this thing with you know and I I've got a great theory that uh, whether I'm right or wrong, but but I think I'm right. You know they had Hollywood and they had Hollywood for over well over a hundred years, and Hollywood projected America around this world like nothing else because they always won. John Wayne always came in and the cavalry were following afterwards and everybody had a tear in their eye and the USA always won. Well, this is the way they acted on the golf course when, when the, you know, the, all this supreme confidence and, and, you know, I'd been over there playing their tour and I was playing alongside them. Uh, so, and, and I learned to beat them, quite frankly, and, and that was it. So I wasn't fearful personally anymore but I'd had my experiences uh, many of my countrymen hadn't had this, the, the, those experiences but uh, I think they appreciated how tough it was to, to go over there and, and, and do uh, what I did I won a couple of P uh, Jacksonville Opens as well as the US Open so when we got there in 69 having won that Open I think it must have sort of filtered down the team uh, you know that if if Jacko can do it, well, you know why can't we? Sort of thing, and it was a marvelous week. It was a different format 
uh, to what we play today. And I actually played Jack Nicholas twice on the last day in the singles. And we played in the morning, and he, he really wasn't playing, you know, on top of his game. I beat him four and three. And long story short, by the after, late afternoon, uh, we were ended up. I held a 50-foot putt on the 17th. It was an, crazy. I mean, you trying to get it in, but it was an element of good fortune. It went in to square the match, and we stood on 18T, all square, and the matches were all square. And uh, it was an unenviable situation, as far as I was concerned. And we both hit tee shots down the last hole, and. I was racing off ahead and Jack hollered at me from behind, Tony. So I waited, he caught me up, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, we walking. Are you nervous? I said, Jack, I'm petrified. He said, I just thought I'd ask, because if it's any consolation, I feel exactly the same way you do. Which, which you know, was nice. He put it in perspective, and uh, as nice as it could be, but all your teammates are around the green and there's thousands of people there, you know, not knowing what's going to happen. We both hit good shots, uh, mine rolled to the back of the green, he was a bit inside me, and I putted up 20 inches to two feet short. The greens weren't quite the same in those days as they are today. So I marked my ball and he had a 20 foot, 18 foot or maybe to win outright for America. And he ran it four and a half feet or five feet past which was a shocking, you know, there was a sort of pregnant silence all around the green and I'm just stood there thinking, whatever happens, I gotta make this putt. You know, I'm gonna have to make this putt, whatever happens. And like the great player he is, he knocked his putt in. And prior to picking his ball out of the hole, he picked my marker up, and then picked his ball out, and he handed me the ball, conceding the putt saying, I don't believe you'd have missed that, but I would never give the opportunity in these circumstances, which was unbelievable. And, uh, you know, tie, first tie in Ryder Cup history, and a gesture that was just unparalleled, you know, in our game, because, I mean, the, the, the American team, uh, captained by Sam Snead, there were a lot of old, uh, a lot of mean-spiritedness in there, you know, mixed in with, they were all tough guys, these, brought up the hard way in the 40s and 50s, and, uh, you know, and you don't do things like that, you know, uh, when it comes to Ryder Cup. Yeah, I think it's Sneed was quoted as saying, we didn't come over here to be good old boys, words to that effect. But uh, Jack, of course, said nobody, nobody said anything personally to him, because he was so respected anyway, and, um, uh, we we tied and, and uh, you know we built a golf course all those years later. It's been open ten years now in Florida. It's a very successful private club called the Concession, and um, uh, part of history. And uh, it's a lovely story. And uh, Jack was always the, the consummate sport. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 18 majors, uh, 19 seconds, and 11 thirds or whatever. Nobody will ever touch that record. It was a a wonderful time, and uh, and he said he said it uh, a dozen times. You know, it was the right thing to do. I'd do it every time. You know, it's just the way you saw it. And if the shoe had been on the other foot, what ifs and buts? I know. Would you? Well, have, it's would you difficult. Have done? It's difficult. I think I. I think I would. It, 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 it's, it's fantasy. I mean, I, the point was I'd won the Open two months before. We were good friends, but more than that, uh, golf had won. You know, they had a British champion for the first time in 18 years, and he didn't want to see anything happen to spoil that. And, you know, that was all to do with his uh, uh, generosity. I was a fr good friend as well, and uh, we've remained that way uh, for 47. Well, I've known him now for 50 years. We've been close. For the next five Ryder Cups, which you played in, America, dominated and America won them all to the point actually in 79 which was your last Ryder Cup as a player that he decided it had become so one-sided that um, it couldn't be America versus Britain and Ireland anymore it would have to be America versus Europe the whole the whole of the continent now looking back 
Um, I don't know how you felt at the time, but uh, it was a bit of a, con we talked about the word concession. It was, it was a concession that you're not good enough to take from America. You need, you need, you need the cavalry, you need some reinforcements. Well, what happened in, in 79, which is due to what happened in 77, Tom Weisskopf got picked to play for America and didn't turn up. He went to shoot some goat or in Alaska because it was a foregone conclusion as far as, and that sort of the writing was on the wall. I mean, you don't, that was the first time anybody from either side had got picked for the Ryder Cup and didn't turn up. And so that prompted Jack to write to Lord Derby, who was the president of the PGA, and say, look, you've got to in, involve Europe and to, you know, make the team stronger. Well, there was a lot of people against that. I wasn't one of them. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought it was a good thing that that, that should happen. And you, we had Seve Ballesteros, who was you know, on the rise. He won the championship in, in 79, out of the car park at Lytham, wherever it was. And, and uh, you know, we had some good European players coming along. So uh, we turned up the Greenbrier uh, for the first European match, which ended up being my final uh, match. And uh, again, we got beaten, well beaten. They set the course up. Uh, to suit themselves. I mean, the Greens were putting about 14 and we weren't used to that, but we got well beaten anyway. And then um, I didn't get invited in 81. I just missed out. I, I wasn't a captain's pick either. And I'd done with the establishment by then. It was a long story. I won't bore you with it. But Seve was also barred, barred from playing Ryder Cup in 81 because his manager was insisting on appearance fees for him because he put 50% on the gate if he turned up. And of course he wasn't there, I wasn't there at Walton Heath and again we got beaten uh, substantially and uh, the, the, the writing started to come up, you know, are we ever going to get this done again? And uh, So I was quite shocked in 83 when I was invited and it, this was the, the year of the Ryder Cup. Normally they invite a captain 18 months or so before and obviously behind the scenes there was turmoil and I was invited in April or so of, of 83 to, you could have knocked me down with a feather. And, but I was in a position where I didn't really care. I certainly didn't care for what the establishment had been doing two years before. So I was in a position to make some demands because I'd recognised there were things that we weren't doing that we should have been doing. And, and as I said earlier, America had all this supreme confidence. We were flying in the back of the bus, wearing anything anybody would give us. We couldn't take our caddies with us. And by the time we got to the first tee, our self-esteem was about this big. Uh, you know, they were already two up and they hadn't even a shot. Uh, so I started demanding, you know, obviously first class travel, the best of clothing, caddies to travel, um, a team room where we could gel as a team and get that sort of team unity going. And they kept saying yes. And so I, I said, well, in, on that basis, I'll do it. And then I remember vividly going to Lord Derby and saying, what about Seve? You know, because he was mad, uh, quite rightly so. And uh, Derby said, well, it's your problem now. You've accepted a captain's job. And so I made uh, my first mission was to sit Seve down and had breakfast at Prince of Wales Hotel a week later in Southport. And he was venting, and as, as he would. And I said, well, you know, I've accepted this uh, captain's role. I can't do it without you. You know, I mean, I can do everything off the course, but I need you. Uh, on the course, you're the general, you know, you're the man everybody fears. He was the best player on the planet. And uh, in the end, he said, okay, I help you. And uh, it was amazing. I mean, the rest history, really. I mean, we, we came within a point of winning in, in uh, Palm Beach Gardens. That year, the best performance we'd ever had in America. And we were all very, very down. We'd gone so, so close. And I can see a line now, There's a, I've got a video at home of it, it was on the dais, very, very low, every face was, and it was Seve again that looked along and he said, hey, this is not a time to be so sad. He said, this is the best we've ever come, done in America, you know, it's a, a great performance. And 
course, he was right when we put it all in perspective, and we took that as a, you know, uh, we took it to the Belfry in 85. The momentum was unbelievable. Nucleus of the team were the same. We had a couple of new major winners come, coming on board in, in Europe, Woosnam, and, and the last bell was coming along, and there was, Faldo was already there, and we had some, some great players. And uh, front of the home crowd, you know, got it done for the first time in 28 years. And Langer was 28 years old at the time. And I remember him saying, for me, 28 years is a very long time. And of course it had been. And we were on the roof at the Belfry. I, I was sleeping there last night, funnily enough. And, you know, that memory will last forever. I was on Sam Torrance's shoulders in a very precarious position, but champagne was flying. And uh, it was the beginning of uh, a wonderful run, you know. 87, of course, we won for the first time on American soil at Jack's course in Muirfield Village. And I might just say that, you know, he was probably the only one, I mean, his reputation and his persona was so uh, held in such great regard, it didn't hurt his career, you know, to, to be the first losing captain. And, uh, but it did wonders for our self-esteem and confidence and we went on and tied again at the Belfry in 89 which meant we retained it and I felt it was time for me to, to, to leave because you know I, there's nowhere else to go with it with one home and away and I'd been convinced to do it one more time at home uh, probably thinking I was pushing my luck but uh, you know to come out with a tie and just you know uh, retain it was enough and I and I it would have been self-indulgent to 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 keep on doing it uh, it was time for somebody else to take the reins. Since you departed from being captain there have been many great captains many great names many great victories many great moments but uh, you must be proud to 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 know what a part you played in 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 horning Europe up uh, to be upright, to be winning, because it's carried on. It hasn't dropped off. The, no. the run of success has been remarkable. Well, you know, at that point in time, I was the one that went to America first and stayed there and played and, and learnt how to beat them. And I was probably 12, 12 or 15 years older than most of my team by the time I took over. And I think they respected the fact that I'd had the experience and, and done, and that's why they were very happy to let me, uh, you know, do it my way, if, if that's the right uh, expression. And, you know, it was since, and it was soon after that, that, that well, by then, they, they were experiencing what I'd experienced in America. Sebi was winning in America. Faldo was winning in America. Langer was winning in America. Woozy was winning in America. So, they'd, you know, it was a timing is everything in life. And, and it ju it ju we just happened at that time, it was a golden time for European golf. Uh, we, we got it right. And, um, you know, it, it's been right for quite some time since when it comes to Ryder Cup competition. And it's become an incredible uh, oh, sporting yeah. event now, oh, yeah. both to play in, obviously, but also yeah. the crowds, the TV coverage. It's, it's become this... Well, in a nice the, way, a monster. Yeah, well, next to the Olympic Games and the World Cup uh, soccer, I mean, it's uh, it's right up there as a team thing. And I think it's 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 amazing how public, the general public, do relate to team or seem to relate to team more than they do individual. And there's no doubt that there's a passion comes about this thing. That uh, I mean, and of course you couldn't you couldn't write a script for what's happened in in some recent Ryder Cups, when it all looks like it's lost and, you know, the pressure comes in and, and stuff happens that you couldn't write a script for. So, no, it's, it's captured the imagination of, uh, uh, of the sporting world, there's no doubt about it. And also, uh, players have become almost more synonymous with the Ryder Cup than actually individual uh, uh, performances. Ian Poulter seems to be a different animal. Uh, Colin Montgomery obviously enjoyed huge successes as a, as a player, but again, as as uh, in the in the Ryder Cup, he became a, a force of, Sergio, of, of, of nature. Sergio, same way. I mean, he, you know, Sergio hasn't up to now got the major done, but he's been a f tremendous force as well in Ryder Cup. You're right. I mean, 
they, they, there's something in this team that, uh, that, that rubs off on these guys. They, all of a sudden they can they put their personal interests and, and, uh, behind them and feel that they can contribute uh, to the fullest extent as individuals in the team. And it's extraordinary. Uh, and you better be on your blub when you get picked for that Ryder Cup because there's no hiding place out there. You know, there's an expectation from the public uh, uh, and, and the home crowd if you're at home. And, and your team, uh, and you're all intertwined. You know, it's not about you. It's about, it's about the team. So there's more pressure. There's no doubt there's more pressure. I mean, selfish. You win majors, that's a very selfish a singular pursuit to do that. But that Ryder Cup coming down that last hole at Birkdale in, in 69, and all your teammates are sitting around the green uh, waiting to see what you're going to do, and, and that's pressure. You know, that's real pressure. And, and needless to say, you know, the thousands of fans there and at home that are watching on television, it's unbelievable. It really is. Tough one to call this year, though, Tony, in, in some sense, because it's, it's in America. Uh, some of the old guard of the European team may be reaching the end. There's going to be some new names, new faces, uh, not familiar with the added pressures of the Ryder Cup. And presumably the Americans are, must be quite close to having had enough of being beaten by the Europeans. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's at Hazeltine, ironically, where I won my US Open, which is... Uh I'll be there, obviously. I'm a member of the club and, and, and I should be watching closely. Uh, yeah, I mean, the teams as we s sit here are an unknown quantity, but there are a lot of very good young players uh, in America now. Davis Love, who's the American captain, has had experience. Uh, it wasn't a good one. It, it was stolen away at the last minute in Medina from him. But, of course, he's got that experience going for him, uh, for him and he'll be... Uh, wanting revenge, there's no doubt about that. And and there's a lot of very good young players on that on that tour. Uh, our team is an unknown quantity at this time. Uh, we'll do well to retain it. We need to get off to a fast start. That's what we need. We need at the end of the first day to be at least level or ahead. If 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 they assert their authority early, it's going to be very tough for Darren Clark's team this year. Now, playing the Ryder Cup is difficult enough. Uh, being the captain is a completely different set of, of skills. It's, it's you're handling 12, 12 human beings, 12 egos. Uh, they're, not, they're not all going to get what they want. And you've got to somehow find uh, the best pairings, the best teams. doesn't necessarily, in fact, it doesn't really go on form. It goes on getting the right mix. It, it's, it's, a quite a, it's a very demanding uh, well, role to have. It is especially today because it's become such a media frenzy and everything is dissected and why did he do this and why did he do that, which, which uh, you know, I, I did a lot from here, gut feeling. Uh, it's very hard to do that today, you know, because you're going to be saying, what did you do that for? They didn't win, you know, or whatever. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the buck stops at the captain and, and, and uh, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy job. It's great if you win. But you've got to do a lot of this, a lot of praying. That way you make your decisions, you get your pairings as good as they can be, but it's about momentum in the end. Uh, and it ebbs and flows, and you've just got to, you've got to pray a lot and, and do everything right. I mean, there's so many guys involved now. I don't know how many vice captains there are and this, that, and the other. I never vice captains, you know. I had Bernard Gallagher was my runner. He was with me when I was doing it. but. Now it's got to a point where there's a lot of advice and sometimes, you know, too many cooks can spoil the broth. So we'll see. Uh, that's why we go. Let's just quickly go back to, to the Open because the, it's almost upon us. Um, and very difficult always to say, oh, he will win or it's between those two because it doesn't work like that. You, you don't have to be the best golfer in the world, do you, to win a major? You just need to be the best golfer for that week. For that week. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, you can be fortunate with the weather. Uh, your first two rounds is a bit of a crapshoot, really. I mean, getting, you know, if you get the right tee time and the weather's not. But getting ahead early is important. You can't win the first two rounds, you can lose it. But just staying in the mix early on, 
But having, you know, there's, I think one of the top 15 players in the world is going to end up victorious. I don't think there'll be many surprises there. It would, it would, I would be very surprised if it was, uh, uh, you know, some, some obscure name that, that, that won at the end of the day. It's going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And also what's interesting is, is two years ago, Rory McIlroy was, well, the world was at his feet. Um, people were saying this, people were saying things like, oh, he's going to go on and match Jack. And then suddenly from seemingly nowhere, this young American kid, Jordan Spieth, uh, wins everything. And then he has a, a little bit of a, sort of a mental crisis. Um, and Jason Day is, is now enjoying his golf. But nobody actually, as is the way with golfers, actually say, no, no, this is my game for the next two, three, four, five years. So it's, it's pretty open, isn't it? Roy seems Very to be open. suggesting he's coming yeah. back. I mean, ambition has no nationality, you know. You, there's, you don't know what's going on these young, young minds, and there's so much talent. The, the interesting thing is it's, it's, they're getting younger, and, you know, when you're young, you're so resilient and you're so elastic, you can bounce back, and you, uh, you've got this resilience going for you. Uh, and there's a lot of talent out there. So it, it's going to be fascinating to see who, I think, with a good start, you get engaged mentally at a higher level early. And if it's in you to do it, uh, but whoever wins it will have put it in there first. And it helps a lot if you've done that because you're not shocked when that final day comes and you're walking with a chance to win down the 18th hole. You've got to, you know, you, you, if you've put it in there, and Seve did it, Player did it, Nicholas did it, all, they all did it. Visualisation, uh, seeing their name at the top of the leaderboard, uh, you know, living it really before it, before it happens. And, and it's never easy, but w with that mentality, you feel more comfortable with all the pressure that you've got to deal with. Uh, it still comes to, down to putting one foot in front of another. And, and I guess as well, if you're Nicholas or Ballesteros or Jacqueline, certainly for two or three years, um, it's not only being comfortable seeing your name at the top of the leaderboard, but also knowing that the opposition see your name at the top of the leaderboard and think, oh, I've, I've got to try and topple Jacko or yeah. Nicholas or, or Seve, yeah. and boy, that's not going to be easy. Well, that's right. It, you know, it, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, people talk to me, uh, and, and it, it's difficult to put a finger on this, but, you know, many golfers I consider friends. But more than anything, I see them as having been travelling companions. We were all so competitive. It was hard to get really, really close as, 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 as friends. I mean, Jack now, and Jack's 76, I'm 72. Uh, we're still, we are friends now, we're pals. If, you know, if there's a problem, then either can help, it's, it's the way we go. But as you're younger, you, you know, your doctors become your close friends, your lawyer becomes your close friend, it could be a neighbor that's your close friend. Somebody at the club, you, you just get attracted to, but we were so competitive as golfers, in my younger life, I looked upon them as, and we had dinner at night, and we had good times, and we laughed, but when you get your game face on the next morning, you know, you want to beat their brains out, so it's, uh, it's just the way it is, it's a competitive world I've enjoyed all my life, and I have much respect for all the great players that I've played alongside, and uh, played with, it's, uh, I think we have a mutual respect for each other that, uh, that exists, that is larger than friendship, if that makes any sense at all. You'll be going to the Open, presumably. Uh, why are you there? What will you be doing? Well, I'm, I'm at the Championship at Troon. I'm looking forward very much to it. I shall stay, be staying at uh, uh, Trump Turnbury, where I've enjoyed many, many... I've been going there for over 50 years. And uh, I shall be there on a daily basis greeting and meeting the Glemorangie uh, guests from all over the world. They'll be coming in. I should put the Glemorangie tent. We're doing various lunch every day and there's uh, gatherings in the evening at Turnbury where I shall try and wax lyrical about some of my Open Championship experiences. 
Uh, there have been many, and they're, they're fond memories, I must say. And, uh, you know, if they've got questions, uh, some of these younger folk, uh, it's all changed a lot in the last uh, 53 years since I played my first Open. But uh, it, it's uh, in a healthy state, our game. And uh, the likes of the companies like Glen Rogi and, and Moe Hennessy, who are the parent company, being involved in our, our game really helps it along tremendously. And uh, I, I, I'm the ambassador for the brand, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, it's a great brand, and I think uh, the involvement in the Open Championship for the last five years or so has, has helped the brand along. And, and uh, you know, we, we certainly uh, have an appreciation in the business of golf for, for great sponsorship. And uh, from that point of view, young players, sponsors, it's, uh, the game is in a, in a very healthy state, far healthier than it was when I turned professional in 1962 anyway. And one final uh, topic, uh, uh, Tony, we've talked about the Open, we've talked about the Ryder Cup, both happening this year. One other thing is happening this year which is unique, and that is that golf, after a long, 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 long absence, returns to the Olympics. Although, as we speak to each other today, the players are, are dropping like flies in terms of withdrawing from the Rio Olympics. Now, that in one sense seems a shame. I know you have a, you have a view about golf at the Olympics. Well, I did, you know, the, the, this was bubbling up some four or five years ago when, when the, the word got out that we, we, there was going to be re reintroduced. But personally, I've never seen golf as an Olympic sport. I have, I have to just say that. It's just my, my feeling, it's the truth. Uh, and professionals in there as well, uh, you know, if, if, if golf were to be represented, I see it more, it should be by, by amateurs. Uh, and there was a consensus on our tour, on the PGA Tour, uh, a blind thing, that no names, but there were about 70%, I think, came and thought that the game was in a healthy state without the Olympics, and we, we have our Olympics in the Masters, and the Open, the US Open, and the PGA Championship. And uh, most of my uh, fellow professionals around the world uh, would just as leave have uh, own a claret jug as, as own a, a, an Olympic gold medal. And, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is coming out now. I think there was a, there was a sort of uh, move thinking that it would help grow the game uh, if we were in the Olympics. And, uh, we're all talking about growing the game, but I think there's other ways we need to look at, you know, encouraging juniors and more clubs, uh, getting kids involved at some of the more stuffy clubs, especially in Great Britain, uh, and, and uh, getting the, around the golf course quicker, uh, some alternative options to the golf ball that we're using. Um, there are many things that can be done to, 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 to grow the game. And of course, whoever wins that gold medal this year, sadly, is, is going to know that he hasn't been the best in the world because the best, are, a lot of the best in the world are not going. So it's got a bit messy, hasn't it? It's, it's not really going to help the Olympics because so many of the golf stars, the true stars, aren't playing and it's not really helping golf either for the same reason. Well, that's right. And of course, it was a test anyway. It was uh, this year in 2020. And one thinks, uh, I think, that... Uh, they'll drop it like a hot potato after 2020. That would be my opinion. Unless, unless they do something to change uh, the attraction of, of it, like introducing it as an amateur thing. Uh, but uh, it, that's not my problem. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just an observer now. But my, my feeling has always been that, uh, you know, I think about the Olympic Games, I see it as track and field. I see, you know, the, all the obvious, uh, Golf is, just, just, just doesn't fit in there uh, some way in my, in my mind, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. And finally, Tony, uh, I'm now going to give you the keys to the sport. You can do anything you like. You're in charge, globally, of golf. Now, you mentioned just now that still too many stuffy clubs, even today, too many stuffy clubs. Muirfield, which I know is one of your favourite golf courses in the world, is embroiled uh, self-made uh, mess about uh, not voting for women members. They're now forcing to have another vote very quickly. 
there are still issues which you think wouldn't still be around in, in 2016. So you're in charge, Tony. Uh, what would you do? Well, I, I think your feels a bit like Brexit. Uh, I think there's a lot of people regret, regret that decision and I think they want to reshuffle and, and to have another go. Now, whether Brexit's going to be allowed to do that, who knows? But, you know, golf should be available to as many people as possible. I mean, there's a lot of good uh, things going on, uh, but essentially we've got to bring the kids into it, the next generation. It all goes past so quick, life. And, you know, we've all seen, it's, it's not a matter of national, uh, nationalities. If, if you're exposed to the thing early, it doesn't matter whether you're Chinese, Japanese, English, Belgian, uh, it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, and so we need, we need to think about that and, and just make the game uh, more available and, uh, you know, encourage junior tournaments. I mean, I've, I had a wonderful, uh, last 25 years watching my youngest son. We took him to Florida tournaments and junior events and we see it's a wonderful game for young people. The disciplinarian, I've seen him in tears and it's, it's such a tough, it's tough, you know, to, to take what golf gives you, you know. All the way you can go 15, 16 holes and it's all, and then you make a triple and it's heartbreaking, you know, especially if you're this high. Uh, but you learn, and it, it toughens you up, and it's a, a great, great game, and it's a microcosm of life. It, it's, it's the best game ever. Uh, there's no question about it. I know it's hard, but uh, it takes you into God's out of doors. It takes you, that we can go anywhere in the world now, nowadays and meet good people. Uh, people who play golf are pretty patient. You know, they wouldn't be playing very long if they, 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 they weren't. They're pretty good sorts generally, whether they're Australian. If you play golf, you're my friend anyway. And uh, I, I think we need to just open it up to more youngsters and encourage the youngsters uh, as much as we can. And you mentioned Florida. You've, you've got a house in Florida next to a golf course, near to a white beach. It's 12 month a year sunshine. Uh, your name remains uh, famous, despite the fact you're now into your 70s. Uh, everybody, certainly everybody of a certain age knows exactly who you are. All in all, Tony Jacklin, uh, it's been some journey from the son of a truck driver in Scunthorpe who spent a year working in steelworks. It's, it's some journey. No, it's been a magic. I've had a fantastic life. What can I tell you? I mean, it was, uh, 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 it's been an adventure and that's what it was supposed to be. Um, you know, I, uh, I suppose as much as anything, I was always quite open-minded and I had a go and I never thought about uh, consequences uh, much. Uh, you know, what if uh, it was, I had a positive outlook. I, I always thought about winning. Uh, other people have said to me, you know, well, what if you hadn't done it? I said, well, it never crossed my mind that I wasn't gonna do it. But maybe I was a bit stupid, I don't know. But uh, it's certainly been an adventure. I mean, obviously, uh, the rewards for, for my generation weren't quite as, as what they are today, but it didn't diminish the, the fun we had doing it and the times we had. And, uh, you know, uh, what we're supposed to do is set the table for the generation after. I think we did that. Okay, Tony, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome.